And I say neither, either, either, and neither, neither. And let's call the whole thing off. Yes, you like potato, and I like potato. You like tomato, and I like tomato. Potato, potato, tomato, tomato. Let's call the whole thing. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today. And then today's speaker is Cassie Anderson. She is the horticulture extension specialist in Adams County. And Cassie grows a huge garden every year. She grows lots of tomatoes and she's she's just so knowledgeable about this topic. So I'm going to turn it over to Cassie and let her take it away. Welcome, everybody. Today, we're going to talk about tomatoes. I will forewarn you, I've got way too many slides for this presentation, so I'm going to talk quickly. I do have a list of some uh, vegetable varieties that will be getting sent out afterwards. So when we get to the varieties pay, um, page, and there's so many more than I listed there, it's just a teeny little smattering. Um, you don't have to frantically try and write them down. But today we're going to cover definitions about of tomatoes. We'll uh, talk about different types and different categories of tomatoes. We'll talk about transplanting and uh, getting your tomatoes ready to go outside. We'll touch a bit on care of tomatoes, watering, fertilizing, mulching, that kind of thing. I will get into and try and be as brief as I can about troubleshooting tomatoes because tomatoes are the princesses of the garden. There is a lot to troubleshoot. And then I'll also hopefully at the very end have a few moments to talk about how to best enjoy and eat a tomato. Okay. So first off, what are tomatoes? They are a plant that belong in the nightshade family, Solanaceae. Uh, Lycopersicum esculentum um, is their scientific name. And tomatoes are ones that really tend to be uh, historic. A lot of the, the plants in the Solanaceous family can be poisonous. Deadly nightshade is a really um, pop common one. And so for a long time in Europe, especially, they were unwilling to eat tomatoes because they were believed to be poisonous because they looked so similar to things like deadly nightshade shown on the right hand side here. You can see how similar that deadly nightshade looks compared to the more of a cherry type tomato. Um, but now we've, we've spent a lot of time and effort on breeding tomatoes to have a whole bunch of different varieties. There's over 10,000 different varieties. And there's so many different options. I see a lot of questions coming in about different varieties and different ways to grow them. I'll, I only have an hour, so I'm only going to touch on a few little things here and there. But there's a lot of different options for tomatoes. Uh, the common debate on tomatoes, are they a fruit or are they a vegetable? Technically, they are a fruit. They contain seeds. But actually, the Supreme Court did do a rule on tomatoes in 1893 and declared that tomato is a vegetable. Um, but botanically, it is a fruit. So really, it's both. And it's kind of depending on your, your goals uh, with it. If you want to say that you're having a fruit salad by chopping up tomatoes and some basil and some uh, mozzarella, then it's, it's, you can call it a fruit salad. <laughs> it's up to you. <laughs> uh, tomatoes originally came from South America. Our wor the word tomato comes from tomati, which was used by the Indians of Mexico who grew the plant, um, have grown the plant for many, many centuries. Uh, they likely were native in the Andes Mountains of Peru, Ecuador, and Bolivia, and they slowly may have made their way across the entire world. And so tomatoes are, I said there were 10,000 different varieties. There's so many tomato options. You can have black, you can have almost a white, you can have pink, you can have green, you can have that standard brilliant red, orange. There's so many different colors of tomatoes. One thing to really, um, when you start thinking about tomatoes to, to be aware of when you're making your decisions is to know what kind, what type of tomato you are purchasing. There's generally speaking, three types of tomatoes. There are the determinate tomatoes. These are bush type. They usually grow about three to five feet tall. It's a fairly um, compact comparatively to the indeterminates. Uh, they tend to throw most of their fruit in one big crop over about a month, month and a half. Uh, a lot of these are canning and um, paste varieties that you, you want them to all have their fruit ripe at the same time or around the same time so that you can make a big batch of 
of canned of tomato sauce or paste or whatever you're, however you're processing them. Um, the nice thing about the determinate tomatoes is that they don't really need support. So it's one that if, especially if you're a container grower, they might be a good one to look for because you don't have to think or worry about trellising. And I will get into trellising in a little bit of detail later. There is also semi-determinate. These are not nearly as common of a variety. There's a lot fewer of them. They're also a bush type, usually grow about five feet tall. You, there are several um, distinct flushes of fruit over the season, but it's not going to be continual growing and continual fruit set. They will need some kind of support or cage, and they're not very common. There's only a few types. I've only seen them a few times when I've been looking around at tomatoes. They are a really nice choice, though, if you really get overwhelmed and you're not very good at pruning. Um, that's definitely something that speaks to me. I want to try some more semi-determinates um, just to keep that size a little bit in check. Uh, and then there's the indeterminates. These are more common. These are pretty much most of the cherry tomatoes. A lot of our heirloom tomatoes are indeterminates. They're more of a vine. They will grow and set fruit all summer so that they will continue to put new flowers and new fruit on the terminal tips of all of the canes, all of the vines that you allow to continue growing. Um, and they definitely need some kind of cage or staking or something like that um, to could support them and get the, the best pr product production and the best harvestability off of them. And then we get into different categories of tomatoes. There's, there's different sizes of tomatoes and you have different uses for them. They, they mature at different speeds. So there's currants. Those are less than half an inch in diameter. They're teeny, teeny, tiny ones. Cherries, quite common, half, half an inch to an inch in size. The salad slicers are round and kind of a medium size. You're canning, pasting tomatoes, often oval in shape, not always. Uh, and then the beef steak, usually they're those wide ones, big enough to put an entire slice crosswise onto your, your hamburger patty at your 4th of July barbecue or that kind of thing. Uh, so we'll get into a little bit here. Our cherry tomatoes, they're smaller fruit. Plant sizes can be, dwar there are dwarf options for cherry tomatoes, um, but the indeterminate types that are not dwarf can be six feet, eight feet long, depending on how many resources, how long your season is. Uh, generally speaking, cherry tomatoes, you don't need to plant a lot of these plants to get a good harvest. One plant is often sufficient for a family of four because they are prolifically productive. They will give you tomatoes for a daily salad for your family, most of the, most days while they are producing. And there's lots of different ways you can use those cherries. I put the pear cherry pear tomato here because I have a soft spot for them. You can get them in red and yellow varieties. Uh, they're, they're very, the cherry tomatoes tend to be fairly universally accepted. Uh, people who don't like the big beef steaks or salad slicer style tomatoes often will prefer cherries. A lot of them are a little bit sweeter um, a little bit more palatable and just great for snacking. Sometimes they don't even make it in, in out of the garden. Then there are those salad slicers. These are those that are kind of the size of a baseball, maybe a little bit smaller. You can get them in both determinate and indeterminate varieties. Usually you'll have them start being ready in July uh, and beyond. Um, generally speaking, you can harvest these guys a little bit early if it's late in the season and you're worried about frost and let them ripen on your counter. Uh, salad slicers have a wide variety of different uses. You can dry them up, you can put them in your sandwiches and eat them fresh in your salads. Uh, you can cook with them or you can eat, have them fresh. It's totally up to your preference and the particular types of salad slicers that you end up, that you do purchase. And then there's the canning and pasting tomatoes. Uh, not all of them are plum shaped, but many of them are. Uh, they generally have a high amount of sugars and a high amount of acids, which gives them lots of flavor. They also have a lot of pectin in them and they are lower in water. They're more solid instead of liquid uh, than some other tomato types because the intent is to take them and cook them down for canning and take paste purposes. These ones, if you're getting, if you're growing them for that purpose, it's a good idea to kind of cut back on both fertilizing and watering as you get closer to harvesting that will help concentrate those flavors more intensely and give you a, a, a stronger flavor once you're ready to, to harvest. And you can get both determinate and indeterminate types, although this is the most common type to be determinate. So that type that sets a couple big flushes and produces over a shorter span of the season. 
And then, of course, there's the beefsteak. These are the ones that most people end up are talking about when they're talking about uh, wanting to grow a tomato. These are the largest ones. Some of them can be over two pounds. Almost all invariably, these guys are indeterminate, so they will continue growing as long as we have a season that allows them to grow. But many of them do take a long time to mature. So these are ones that you might get a head start on early. Make sure that you do some kind of season extension if you really want to get a long season of harvest for them. Um, and there are both heirloom and hybrid varieties of these guys as well. Did take out my discussion on hybrid and heirloom. Um, both are great. The hybrid options are really good if you end up having disease pressures in your landscape. Okay, here's that slide I mentioned. We will send this out, so you don't need to frantically uh, write everything down. But if you like cherries, sun golds, uh, the yellow pear, sweet 100, and peace vine are some great options. For slicer, black truffle, green zebra are some really good ones if you want a little bit more unique. Um, paste, Amish paste, and speckled Roman are really good options. And then that beef steak, um, the Cherokee purple is one of my favorites. Prudence purple is also great. Uh, Brandywine is probably the industry standard. Uh, it, it is an heirloom though, one though. So if you have some, some disease pressures, then that might be a little bit harder. Uh, there are so many more varieties. Obviously, if I went down into a deep dive of varieties, that would take up like half of this talk. And I wanted to really have time to get into the care and troubleshooting and all of that. So we're kind of pushing through the varieties, but these are some good choices. Uh, if you haven't grown any, or if you want an idea of something, something different to try. Okay, so we are in April right now, uh, almost mid-April. So it's too early for our, our tomatoes to go outside at the moment but hopefully you've got them started. I confess I actually haven't started my tomatoes yet. I'm gonna try and do it this week. Um, life's just been busy. Uh, it is a little bit late to really start um, developing your, or to, it's getting a little late to start planting your tomato seeds if you haven't, um, but you can possibly swing it if you don't mind being a little bit later in the season. But really, if you want, what you want to look for when you have a seedling that either you've started or you've purchased, you want to look, um, look for a few different things in order to have success in transplanting those tomato seedlings out. You want to make sure that the risk of frost has passed. Uh, here along the, the front range in Colorado, that's usually sometime between Mother's Day and Memorial Day. I like to nudge it a little bit later. Uh, back in 2020, we actually did do a little not scientific experiment, but a little test. We planted a tomato early when the soils were still about 50, 50 to 55 degrees. And then a week or two later, we planted once the soils had warmed up to that 60 to 65 degree range, that tomato that we planted early never caught up the whole season to the ones that we planted at the appropriate time. So testing that soil temperature in the morning, uh, using a soil thermometer that you put about six inches down into the soil, is really a good way to make sure that your, your soil temperatures are the right temperature for the plants to be happy. Um, I thought I, I changed one of the degrees, but not the other one. Daytime temperatures should be above 60 degrees, not 600. Uh, that, that, went, that should have been a degree symbol right there. Um, if there's a week where the daytime temperatures are below 55 degrees, the plants can and will get stunted and that can slow them down. You definitely can provide frost protection for your plants. Um, frost protection can be anywhere from making a little high tunnel for them or wall of water. Um, those, um, that will definitely help you lengthen your season, particularly when we're all being impatient gardeners and it just snowed on Mother's Day. Um, it, wall of waters are these little guys right here. You can fill them with water. That water holds on to heat longer. And so it can provide frost protection down to the mid teens, provided the daytime temperatures are high enough to, um, to keep that water warming during the day. You can use a plastic mulch on the soil that will warm the soil. A black plastic will, um, warm the soil a little bit more quickly in the spring uh, and then you can leave it on for the summer to keep those roots nice and warm. Tomatoes like to have warmer roots through the growing season. They do get a little finicky when the temperatures, the air temperatures get above um, 
certain thresholds, but I'll get to that later. I'm getting ahead of myself. So if you really want to, to hack the season or if you see a forecast of day, cool days ahead, some kind of protection for your tomato plants to keep it from stunting them can definitely be beneficial. And depending whether you are starting your seedlings or um, growing them your, or purchasing them from a nursery, there's a few things to really look for. You want to make sure that you have a bright, nice and green color. Um, these guys have just that little bit of purpling on them. That's probably because it was cool right before this all, before uh, a few days before I had these brought these plants out. Uh, but you want to find a nice bright green color. You don't want to see a lot of yellowing. If you see yellowing on these lower leaves, the, the cotyledons, that's okay. That's not a concern. That just means that they've they've gone through their, their resources. They've expended everything that they can into the plant. They're naturally going to fall off. You also want to find one that's somewhere between six and eight inches tall and about pencil thickness in diameter. The reason for this is a lot of times, and I actually was at Home Depot this last weekend and I saw just like these massive bush tomatoes already out. And that's just a little bit big. Um, you definitely can have success with large plants, but the bigger the plant, the bigger your transplant shock is going to be. So if you've got a nice little small plant here that's got maybe five to seven true sets of leaves, that's a great size because it's going to get in, you can plant it a little bit deep, pull off some of these lower leaves, and it will get in and started and established really nice and quickly. Uh, it's easy to start tomatoes too early uh, and get suddenly these, these large plants that are going to struggle a lot more with transplants. So, uh, be buy the small ones. If you see one at the store that has fruit or flowers on it already, if that's the only one that is in the variety you want, you can definitely buy it. But I, I suggest that you pinch off those flowers um, so it doesn't put its energy into setting fruit when it should be putting its energy into setting roots. Okay. Um, planting tomatoes. Their tomatoes can produce adventitious roots. What that means is that the whole way along the stalk of the tomato, the stem of the tomato, they can push new roots if they're under the, in the soil so that you can use that to your advantage. You can um, plant your tomato deep into a trench, kind of flat like here in this picture, and all of that stem will turn into roots that can then successfully root out and give you a really strong plant to grow for the season. You do want to pinch those lower leaves off. You can see in this in this drawn diagram that there's, you can see where the leaves were, they've been pinched off just to help stimulate that root, root growth. Leave at least two sets of, of leaves above the soil surface. You can leave a few more if you're feeling cautious, but this is a great way to plant a tomato super successfully. Okay. Once your tomatoes are in, it's a great idea to use some kind of mulch. Dry grass clipping is a awesome mulch if you if you mow your lawn and you're not treating it with any herbicides or pesticides. Um, you can collect those, those grass clippings, put them down. Some people will put a layer of newspaper underneath. You definitely can do that. Or just keep adding thin layers of grass clippings over the, over the season. Uh, if you apply it too thick, uh, you might get a little bit of a stinky mess. So make sure that you keep it nice and thin. But you can do that after you've put your seedlings into the ground. And definitely give your tomatoes plenty of room to grow. So it's tempting, uh, especially when we have smaller backyards or we're planting in containers to, sit, to, to really want to smush them in and make them, give them, feel like if I'm putting three plants where the package said that I should put two, I'm gonna get 50% more fruit production. Really, unfortunately, that's counterintuitive. You're reducing the amount of available air movement and water availability and nutrient availability. So those plants are going to be less productive than if you gave them that appropriate spacing. If you have better air movement, you're not going to have as much disease pressure um, and you're going to have more, more production. You can definitely grow tomatoes vertically. Um, I don't have a great picture, but I'll get to it. Um, you can string the, the vining tomatoes, the indeterminate tomatoes up onto a string and grow them up vertically for, for many, many, many feet. Giving them more space makes it easier for us to harvest them too and see if there are insects, pests, 
pests or other disease pressures on them. If you can see all of the parts of the plant, it's not obscured, then you can see things a lot more easily. Uh, and tomatoes that don't get trellised up are more likely to have fruit touching the ground, getting wet, and you might be more likely to see decay or disease issues. Um, tre vertical trellises can be a really good thing to, to use. This is similar, similar content, just a different picture of, of that trellis itself and definitely improves the harvest. Uh, this is one system that I really like because it's simple, kind of using a, a wide mesh system where you can literally just weave the tomato through. Uh, those pre-built tomato cages that you see at a lot of big box stores and nurseries, they're cute and fun when the tomatoes are little, but by August when your plant is large, especially if you're growing one of the heirloom types that have big, heavy fruit, those plant, those tomato cages are not going to stand up to the size of your fruit and the size of your plant. So some other form of trellising is important. You can, you can do strings that go vertical. You can do a wide mesh like this. I've seen people use just a stake. You can just use a stake and, and, and secure the tomato onto the stake as it grows up. Um, there's lots of different options for trellising your tomatoes, but it is important to figure out the method that works for you, works for your garden, and works for the type of tomato that you're trying to grow. And this does apply to containers as well. Um, you're not, you're not, uh, you do still need to trellis uh, tomatoes that are being grown in a container because uh, if you don't, sometimes you might get a high wind and things will topple or those tomatoes are just going to spill out onto your, your patio, your deck, your back porch, wherever you have your tomato plant growing. Uh, this concrete reinforcing mesh, which is the picture that I had first, this guy right here, uh, you can use a, a really nice way to do it. You can cut a six and a half, half foot length, um, twist it around, tie it together. That gives you a two foot across um, cage to go around the tomato. It's usually going to give you a nice sturdy support. Uh, just remove that bottom ring of the wire that sticks it into the ground. That's a, a good way to make great reusable tomato cages that are similar to the, the ones that you purchase, but they're going to be a lot more sturdy and a lot more robust and you can use them year after year. Okay, where am I on time? I did it pretty well actually, okay. Um, so when you're growing your tomatoes, uh, lots of different things are going to impact the taste of the tomato. If you have erratic watering, uh, you can have issues such as blossom end rot, which I'll get into in a little bit. You can also see zippering or cracking on the seams. Um, you particularly see this in the cherry tomatoes. A lot of them are so sweet. If you haven't watered them very much and then you give them a ton of water, they'll split. Um, so you might see issues if you're not watering consistently. When I say consistently, I don't mean going out there and watering three times a day. Uh, you want to, you want to, focus your watering attentions. You want to water it so it's nice and deep. That water gets eight to 10 inches down into the soil and then let it dry out a little bit in between. How often you have to do that is going to depend on your soil type, on the, out, on the conditions, the environment, but making sure that you water nice and deeply and then let it dry out in between as well. Soil, uh, soil pH can also impact the taste of your tomatoes. If you have a really high pH or a really low pH, then that's going to change, change the temperatures of your soil as well. And temperature, I'll get into a little bit more on this, but high temperatures and cool temperatures can both impact um, tomato growth and development. And then of course, hang time. Uh, the tomatoes that you leave on the vine are going to have better flavors than those that you have to harvest early. Okay, let's get into a little bit of the, the care itself. Oh, somebody asked about a terracotta. I don't know. I just, I glanced at the q and I'm trying not to do that. I'm trying not to get off, off base. Um, okay, so fertilizing. Fertilizing tomatoes can be a tricky, a tricky thing because sometimes it's tempting to think, well, if a little is good, more is better. But generally speaking, when if you're starting tomatoes from seed, the seed itself doesn't need anything until it started to put its first true leaves out. So you can you can mix that 
initial fertilize until you start to see two leaves. If you get a plant from a seedling from a nursery, if you're planning to plant it immediately, you don't need to fertilize it until it's in the ground. But generally speaking, tomatoes benefit from about three applications over the season, uh, split out about two weeks apart, um, depending on the organic content of your soil. So if you haven't done a soil test, this is my time to plug the get a soil test so you know what your soil organic material levels are. If you have a 5% uh, organic material, you probably are not going to need to do much in the way of supplementing with fertilizer. But if you have less than that, then you probably will need to do a little bit. But you're working with any kind of fertilizer that you prefer to use, the plant is happy to use. They don't care if it's a conventional fertilizer or if it's organic, that's up to your preference. The plant will take it up either way. But the main thing is that you wanna do it you want to probably incorporate some fertilizer into the soil if your organic material is low at planting, and then maybe wait a, a week, a couple of weeks, 10 to 14 days, give it another sh shot of fertilizer, another two weeks, and then another two weeks. You don't want to add too much after the after about three applications because too much fertilizer will actually have the opposite of effect from intended in that the tomato plant can start to say, oh, life's pretty good right now. I don't think I need to actually set flowers and fruit. I think I'm just going to keep growing, keep growing nice leafy greens. I'm going to be really healthy and, and green and happy and not go too much. Um, in the middle of the season, uh, once you start to see a few flowers uh, starting, you can give it another little jolt of a, of a fertilizer. Uh, you can also apply once the fruits of in for a standard size tomato once the fruits have reached about two inches in size so when they're sizing when there's fruits there they're sizing up give it another little a little jolt of fertilizer this is when you can use that water soluble fertilizer whether it be an organic one or that the blue powder that you mix in with your watering can that's a great way to give some extra fertilizer to to your plants okay how about container growing Containers can be great for tomatoes. Uh, it will limit their size a little bit because their rooting volume can't be as large as in the soil. Uh, you're not going to have, be as likely to be overwhelmed by plants. You also have easy access to the plant. Um, and hopefully, hopefully you're not putting it somewhere where you don't see it on a, on a regular basis. But it also just makes it a little bit easier to manage. I actually really like growing tomatoes in containers. The main clip... The main thing here is that you want to have a good amount of size per plant for the tomato itself to grow well. Um, so it's somewhere between five gallons to 15 gallons. Um, the bigger the pot, the bigger you can let that, that vine grow. Uh, just be aware that you'll need to supplement with your, with your sizes if you can. Um, to do. When you're thinking about growing in containers, there are some considerations that you'll need to make. Uh, if you're growing a little patio tomato like this one, this was kind of a little dwarf one that just doesn't grow very big at all. There are a lot of breeds increasingly that are being designed for container growing. They're a little bit, they, you're not going to get the production off of them that you will off of a standard tomato. But when you're growing in a tomato, in a container, you need to fertilize fairly frequently because you're watering through and you're watering until that water runs out of the bottom you are pushing a lot of those nutrients through the soil profiles. You may need to fertilize a little bit more than every two weeks, but don't put quite as much in. Just put a little bit in, um, maybe even fertigate. Uh, fertilize with your watering once, once a week or something like that. And you may need to water a lot. Containers are smaller and they lose water, uh, especially when warm weather comes up, they lose water fairly quickly. So you may even need to water twice a day. The important thing to test if, you're, if your container needs water is to push your finger into the soil and feel underneath, see how that soil feels at least a couple of inches down instead of right on the soil surface. That soil surface is gonna dry fairly quickly. You can definitely use drip irrigation on containers, um, automate it a little bit so that you're not having to water numerous all the time. Um, but containers, containers can be a great way to grow a tomato. Um, cherry tomatoes in a container, uh, the fruit's small, but the vines can be big. So I ideally look for that determinate or semi-determinate, that what kind of one plant per pot. Um, 
find a find a place that has full sun. Uh, here in Colorado, we're fortunate enough to be able to determine full sun as six or more hours of sun. And you do need to uh, make sure you trellis. Some of these are the same as I mentioned before. Um, patio is one of those small container types. Sweet 100 it has a patio variety, um, but there's some other options there as well. Larger tomatoes, ideally you'd want to try and find some kind of dwarf type so the plant stays small, but you will still want to cage or trellis it. Um, make sure that you stay on top of pruning um, and side suckers for the larger tomatoes. That way you uh, keep its size in check. I will get into to tr pruning in just a little bit. But once again, it's that one plant per five to 15 gallon container, full sun for sure. A uh, couple of good ones, Superbush, Demidov, or Husky. Uh, anything in the Husky family of tomatoes. Okay, here's that pruning. I thought it was coming right up. So there are lots of different opinions on pruning tomatoes. Many people who will tell you that this is the absolute only way to do it. Um, honestly, I've had a year where I didn't, I didn't have time to trellis my tomatoes at all. And they grew on the ground and I did have a little bit more loss to critters and insects eating them. And I had a little bit higher rot, but my tomatoes did not die. I had plenty of tomatoes to eat. I was okay without doing anything. But generally speaking, pruning your tomatoes is going to improve fruit production. It's going to improve your access to the tomato. Uh, the very simplest way to prune your tomato is, so if, you if this is your main stem of the plant um, and this is your, main, your, your leaf branch, this little sucker is a little tiny guy that grows out from that middle part. Just pinch that right off. You can do it with a pair of scissors. You can do it with your fingers. Uh, it's totally up to you how you want to do it. You just take those out and that's going to slow your plant down quite substantially. If you leave that sucker to grow, it will eventually grow into a secondary stem of its own, which then produces its own flowers and its own fruit. So you can, you can go that way if you want to, for sure. Um, when you do a, a, a search on the internet for tomato pruning, you get all kinds of different ways that you can get fancy with them. You can uh, prune your, your plant into multiple stems that you then lead off into different directions. If you end up having 12 foot tall tomatoes, this might be a, a method to look into. You're feeding them really well. They're growing fast, strong. You can string them along a string that goes up to a, a top pole. You could then go back down and you can just kind of weave your way back and forth as long as the season keeps growing. Uh, one thing I always threaten to do, I haven't ever had the patience to espaliate a tree, um, but I always want to try to espaliate a tomato. Essentially espalier is when you prune it so that it's flat against a surface and accessible nicely from both sides. Um, but no matter how you do it, it's pro you're probably going to be okay. So if you miss pruning out some suckers and one of them turns into a big old branch, then that's okay. You can, you can prune out the suckers from that point on. Um, the nice thing about vegetable garden, if you mess something up, you can do it again next year. <laughs> um, that's something that always gives me a lot of comfort for sure. Okay. These are the slides that are the heavy hitters. I'm going to try and be quick through them um, because I mentioned tomatoes are princesses. There's a lot of things that can impact a tomato and make it so that you don't have a lot of success. It's one reason that I never suggest tomatoes as a starting plant for a beginner gardener. Everybody wants them to be the starting plant because they're the fun thing to grow. and They're so tasty, but there are a lot of things can, that can go wrong. So environmental issues, you can have this thing called blossom end rot. Blossom end rot is a calcium deficiency, but it's not a calcium deficiency because your soils don't have the right amount of calcium in them. So putting Epsom salt or an eggshell or a banana peel or what was one I just heard recently? I think yogurt was the one that I heard just recently. Uh, putting things into the planting hole is not going to impact your blossom end rot. Really, it's a cold, an issue of cold soils and erratic watering. 
So if you make sure you water uniformly and make sure those soil temperatures are over 60 to 65 degrees, you're not very likely to see issues of blossom end rot, at least here in Colorado. You might start to see your tomatoes wilting and you think, how on earth can my tomatoes be wilting? I've been watering them three times a day. The soil is saturated and they're still wilting. It could be possible that you are watering too much and killing off your roots. Roots definitely need, they need air just as much as they need water. So that's why I say when you water, make sure the soil dries out before you water again. You may see an issue called cap facing where you get weird blobby shapes on your tomato. That often is caused by erratic temperatures, especially when the fruit is starting to set. You may also see zippering. That's where you see a little seam on your tomato. It looks kind of like Franken the Frankenstein monster stitching. Um, that is caused by environmental stress. Um, same with uh, fruit splitting can be caused by erratic watering. Uh, sun scald is one we see fairly commonly in the later season. Uh, if, the, if the fruit is getting too much sun, it can actually kill the, the cells so that you, you don't, so that you um, have a dead part on your plant. Uh, this is one place where putting a, a shade on your, your tomato plant area, putting a, a shade cloth can be really beneficial. You can get shade cloth that reduces the intensity of the sun by a percentage point. And that can really, really help, help with um, reducing the likelihood of getting sun scald. You might have green or yellow sh shoulders, the, the part next to the calyx, the part next to the plant of the fruit. This is often caused by hot temperatures during ripening. There's actually physiological changes that happen um, to the fruit itself when it's ripening, if the temperatures are over a certain threshold, usually about 85 degrees Fahrenheit, not very hot. Okay. Uh, troubleshooting other problems. So disease, uh, there are a ton of different diseases. I'm not gonna get into elaborate detail on these ones, but early blight, septoria leaf spot, cucumber mosaic virus, Fusarium, bacterial canker, tomato spotted wilt virus pictured here are all fairly common viral, bacterial, and fungal issues that we see on our tomato plants. Some of them you can manage a little bit. Uh, early blight, if you see those, the, the first leaf start to get the, it will have a blight, like a, oh, I keep forgetting the word for this this year. It will have a circular spot that looks kind of like a, not in my head. Um, if you well, if you start to see signs of early blight, you can sometimes remove those leaves and and eke that plant through. But if you have a viral issue like cucumber mosaic virus or tomato spotted wilt virus, that is a systemic issue to the plant, and you're not going to be able to get rid of it. You can still eat it. It's not a virus that affects us. So like these fruits here that have been have these uh, mosaic areas, um, they're it's going to be edible. It probably won't taste nearly as good. We do have a great fact sheet, sorry, um, that uh, you can check out for a lot of these disease issues, recognizing tomato problems, fact sheet 2.949, um, that you can read through and you can also reach out to your local extension office to get more details on some of these disease issues. But really, if you have disease pressure, buy hybrid varieties of tomatoes. Um, Rotate your, your areas that you plant your tomatoes in. Try not to plant tomatoes more frequently in the same spot. Um, try to have at least a three to five year gap in between where you're planting them. And make sure you clean up your garden really well in the fall so you're not leaving disease tissue in that landscape that could potentially hold some of those disease problems over year to year. Okay, and then you've got insects. Um, there are a bunch of different insects that like our tomatoes, that hornworm in the, uh, above and white fly below, um, but psyllids are a common annual pest. They migrate in. You can often see that sugar on the, on the leaves. Um, that's, their, that's their poop. Um, psyllids are one that, if you start to see them, there are a few things you can do, but really you want to like really there's not much you can do once they're there. They can bring vector in some diseases. 
Um, but you're not going to have a whole lot of luck getting rid of them um, in the season unless you do some kind of covering and exclusion. Flea beetles are one that we see damage typically early in the season. Usually, unless your plant is very, very small and the damage is very, very substantial enough to prevent the plant to continue to grow, often these guys are a cosmetic and early season problem that you don't see much later in the season. Tomato hornworms, they're going to eat the leaves off of your plant. They are voracious. Uh, they will eat, they can strip a small plant fairly quickly. Um, you can remove them, you can feed them to birds and chickens, you can cut them in half, you can drop them in soapy water. Uh, if you see one that has little white papules sticking out of it, that's a parasitic wasp that actually lays its eggs and parasitizes the, the caterpillar itself. So you can leave that one be and let those wasps do their thing. Um, I have a soft spot for tomato hornworms because I really love the sphinx moth that they turn into. And so I often will have a sacrificial tomato plant that I will put them on and let them complete their life cycle. I'm a little bit of a sucker though. So I'm not saying do as I do, um, but you can tolerate them if you have, if you decide you want to. White flies, uh, this picture at the bottom here, they are an annual pest. They don't overwinter here. They don't tolerate our cold winters but they come from greenhouse grown plants and can come from a nursery. So make sure that you're getting your, your tomatoes from a place that has clean stock. If you see some little white flies flying off of the plant when you go to purchase them, it can be a good idea to avoid that plant in future. And then there's stink bugs. They like to feed on the fruit. They'll pierce the fruit itself and suck out some of the, the nutrients. And so they'll cause a stippling, distorted growth on the outside of the, plant, of the fruit itself. Um, that's one, if you see them, you can manually remove them. Uh, they're not usually a huge issue though. Okay. This is probably the number one question we get about our tomatoes. Um, my, they have a tomato, it's growing, they have no fruit, the flowers are dropping. Sometimes it gets to the point where there's a little tiny fruit, the fruit wilts, it drops off. That is, there, there are several different things that that could be. It could be linked to temperature. If temperatures are above about 85 degrees during the day or 70 degrees at night, um, or if temperature is too low, below 55 degrees, um, that can be influenced as well. Um, th those are kind of the temperature things. Flowers can drop also if they weren't properly pollinated. Um, if you don't see any honeybees or bumblebees in your, in your vegetable garden, then it might be that you might want to try and pollinate the flowers yourself. Um, or you could have where the pollen itself was not viable, so the flowers have, ab have aborted. Um, they, they weren't properly fertilized some, somehow. Um, sometimes flowers will just drop, but those, those are the most, those are the common things related typically to temperature. The other side of it is a lot of times we think a little is good, more is better, and people add a little too much fertilizer. So like I said, the, the, the tomato plants having that fertilizer party, it's just growing and growing and growing. And you're seeing lots and lots of leafy greens, green leaves and stems, but not any flowers or fruit. If that's the case and you've been feeding a lot of fertilizer onto your plants, try cutting back and see if you start to see some, some flat, some flower production and then fruit production. Um, I know here in Colorado, like two years ago, we had 75 degrees, 75 days that were above 90 degrees. Um, that makes it a little bit difficult uh, to make sure that you're getting fruit set when we're consistently staying above 85 degrees, but our tomatoes don't like it that hot. Shade cloth, once again, is a way to reduce that ambient temperature. Um, that can, I, shade cloth and row covers are two things that not as many, that I think more people could use in their vegetable gardens to alleviate a lot of issues. Okay, so why do we plant these again? Well, they taste really good. They give us a good challenge, a satisfying endpoint. It's so satisfying to go and just have a boatload of tomatoes. Uh, if you want a good book, I saw somebody asked about a good book. They're the $64 Tomato by William Alexander. Um, 
tomatoes aren't always a cost savings, um, at least not in the initial outset. If you're building beds and buying soil and buying fertilizer, uh, it can be an expensive prospect to begin with, but eventually you can recoup costs. Um, and honestly, a, a, a yard grown tomato is just so incredibly tasty. <laughs> so they can be well worth it. Okay, so you've made it through all of the hardships of getting a tomato ready and growing in your garden. You started it from seed or bought it as a seedling. It's established, it's growing. When do you know it's ready to eat? Um, there's a couple different terms that could be useful for you to know. Uh, honestly, I often will just kind of massage my tomatoes gently. Uh, usually once they're at about this pinkish stage, um, they're still firm to the touch, but you could harvest them at that point and let them ripen on your counter. Um, at this, this far left picture, this is the breaker stage. It's got a little bit of color on the blossom end, which is not shown here, uh, but it can continue to ripen at that point. If there's no color, if it's completely green and it's not supposed to be a green tomato, then it can be a little bit difficult to, then it likely is not going to ripen for you once harvested. But if there's even a little bit of pink on that blossom end, then that can be a good stage at which to harvest. Um, but you can harvest any point from that breaker point all the way up to, to ripe itself. Um, all of those will continue to ripen inside. And if you have pet problems with pests like squirrels that like to eat your tomatoes when they're at this stage, uh, that can be a good way to kind of circumvent that if you would like to. If you are growing these heirloom types, these big beefsteak softer tomatoes, um, it can be a good idea to harvest them just a little bit early when they're just a little, they, they haven't quite gotten that full red color in them yet, 90%-ish colored up. Uh, you can harvest them at that point and let them ripen inside so that you're not, um, they, they can get very, very soft, these larger tomatoes. You don't, that way you're not harvesting it and your fingers just smoosh into it as well. When you're harvesting tomatoes, especially these big ones, it's a good idea to have a pair of scissors or pruners or a sharp knife to, to cut them off of the plant itself because otherwise you risk tearing the plant, which can introduce disease or stress to the plant if you're wanting it to continue producing. The smaller tomatoes, the cherries and uh, current type tomatoes don't have this issue as much. They tend to release fairly well at the point when they're ripe. So you can harvest those ones a little bit more easily manually pulling as opposed to um, having to clip them. Okay. I was speedy. I actually have more. I thought that I was, I talked too fast in a few places. Well, we can do a little bit of Q&A at the end as well if we need to. Um, so how to taste a tomato. The sugars of the tomato, the sweetness of the tomato is in the flesh of the fruit. Uh, the acid of the tomato is in the gel surrounding the seeds. So if you're one of those people who doesn't like the gel, the liquidy bit, you're not getting the optimal balance of flavor. So it's best to have them together. Keep them together and eat them together, ideally, if you can. Um, obviously, with a smaller tomato, you're not going to have as large of a space, but you want to eat it all together. Ideally, if you have numerous different types, do a tomato tasting. Try, try several different types all at once. You be can begin to see how dramatically different the flavors can be. But tasting those tomatoes can be wonderful. Okay. Oh, I thought I had a few more slides. I've hidden a few slides, actually. Okay. I'm through. I'm sure there are things I did not answer. Um, so I've got eight whole minutes that I can get, you can stump the chump and kind of go through some, some questions for me. Hey, uh, Cassie. Marty, yeah. We had a lot you guys of were busy. Questions. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, someone asked. Uh... I, I can see the Q&A. Oh, okay, good. You can see the Q&A grid. Um, I did uh, drop a couple links in the chat too, by the way. If you would though, Cassie, if you could read the question so that it's on the recording, because I, I will do so. Thank yes. You. Thank you. Sorry. Does the string for trellising have to be a certain gauge or type to be strong enough to support vertical growth of tomatoes or squash, or just use your common sense? Uh, I have found if you're using like the, the biodegradable Cecil type, you do want to get the thicker options. Um, you don't want one that's super, super thin. 
but if you're using synthetic st strings and twines, it usually can be fairly thin. If you look at like baling twine, it's super thin for as strong as it is. So that one's pretty, pretty flexible. Um, common sense, yes, I think would be a good way to put that. Let's see. Can you plant the tomatoes you buy in a grocery store? Uh, if I, I'm guessing they're asking, you're asking if you can plant the seed from the tomato. You can, but it's not likely that you're going to get the tomato that you purchased because most of the grocery uh, the store, the tomatoes we get at the grocery store are, are uh, hybrid type. And so they're not going to plant straight true to seed. I was very sad one year I planted a Brandywine cherry tomato and I didn't realize it was an air, it was a hybrid. And when I planted the seeds that I saved the next year, I did not get my cherry brandy wines. Um, and then I don't off the top of my head know a good variety for fried green tomatoes. Um, I would have to do a little bit of looking around. And should you plant your tomatoes against a south facing wall is north facing better? I would say north facing might be nominally better in mostly because you don't want, I mean, we, we, it, unless you're up in the mountains where you're not hitting 85 degrees regularly, south facing areas are going to get a little bit hotter. So you keeping it cool. I've heard the skin and the seeds are unhealthy. As far as I know, the only people they're unhealthy for are those who have sensitivities to tomatoes. How do tomatoes do with, with hard well water? Uh, as long as you're not, as long as you don't have substantial salt issues, you should be perfectly fine. Um, if you're growing other things, you should be okay. If you are, if you have salts like sodium, then you might have a little bit of trouble growing any vegetables. Besides lawn clippings, what is your preferred mulch to keep soil temperatures cool and maintain moisture? Uh, wood chips mess with the pH, but they're not, you're not sure what else to use. You can, you, I talked about plastic mulch. Plastic mulch can definitely work. Um, I've been using wood shavings lately. They're a lot finer than a wood chip, uh, a lot easier to find. Uh, and you don't have persistent herbicide issues that you can get with straw. Uh, or an organic straw is one of the best options. It can be a little bit tricky to source. Uh, and sometimes you get issues with aminopyrrolid persisting in the straw itself, which can, can smoke your tomatoes, unfortunately. So plastic mulch, grass, straw, uh, any, any, anything like that can be uh, good. Wood shavings is something I've been trying. It's been working well. I don't have a lot of, I don't have any research to back that up though. Uh, let's see. If you don't have any bugs or pests in your raised beds, you still need to rotate the crop. Uh, if you're not if you if you're not seeing disease issues, then yes, you can continue growing in that in that same bed. Um, honestly, insects are one of the least effective for crop rotation in the backyard situation because they're they're mobile. They can go from your one bed to your next. Let's see, what's the newest way to get rid of psyllids and aphids? Um, soap, an insecticidal soap can help. It's a contact um, deterrent. So it's, you're, you're, you're on, it's only going to work if you get it onto them. For aphids, it's super simple. It's a strong blast of water will knock most of, the pop, most of them off. Psyllids can be a little bit trickier for sure. Um, I, off the top of my head, I'm not remembering the specific psyllid control options. Uh, I can throw my email in the chat and you can, we can chat about that offline. Pepper flakes, I don't think are going to impact insects whatsoever. So that's definitely not one that I would, I would suggest strongly. Okay, roots of tomatoes deplete the nutrients in the soil as they're heavy feeders. Is that how to understand why we should rotate planting areas? Uh, roots of any vegetable deplete the nutrients in the soil because they are using the nutrients in the soil to grow the foods that we want to harvest. Um, but different families of vegetables deplete the different nutrients. So we rotate to break disease cycle, to break pest cycle and to um, help control or to Use, use up different levels of nutrients, but that's where you really wanna know the organic material in your soil and you want to fertilize as needed for, for your plants. Oh, will I speak more about shading and protecting plants from the sun? Yes. Um, 
So shade cloth, I mentioned, you can get in varying percentages of how much they shade, how much shade sun they reduce. Uh, usually somewhere in the 15 to 30% shade reduction is a good, good level to look for. Um, I've seen lots of different ways that shade cloth is put up. Amy actually has a great picture. She just has her shade cloth on um, some PVC pipes that are, go over the, the garden bed itself. Um, and that can be a great way to do it. You can put it onto some, some way that you can, you can rotate it a little bit so that you could have it um, move throughout the day if you're that concerned. Um, but really you wanna have it oriented. Oh yeah, it's in Amy's background. Thank you, Amy. <laughs> um, so that's a great example of the shade cloth. My the video is over on my other screen. Um, that's a great example of how to do the shade cloth uh, and can be a great way to help reduce those temperatures a little bit. Uh, you can also make a point of doing just a very light watering um, to reduce ambient temperature in the afternoon. Uh, that can help, help substantially as well. Hey, Cassie, uh, we'll do one more um, just oh, for yeah. time's sake. Love and then we'll, we'll also be answering the rest of these um, after the webinar ends. We'll, we'll continue to answer these questions offline so, or, or in the background. So go ahead and take one more. I'm throwing my email in the chat right now as well. There we go. Great. Okay. Uh, oh, there's a lot of questions about companion planting. <laughs> I... The companion planting is longer than I have time for. I'm going to say, is it better for your plants to have morning sun or afternoon sun? Generally speaking, it's probably, really it's more important that the plants have about six or more hours of sun, but overall it's going to depend on where you can put them and where you're going to be able to provide them the best care. If it's somewhere that's visible, if it's somewhere that's accessible and has good water access, that's more important than morning and afternoon sun specifically. Um, but if you have like one space that's all morning and one space that's all afternoon, I would probably go with morning as long as it's six or more hours, just so you're not having quite as much intense heat on them and you're more likely to, to get that shade cloth or to, you're, mo you're more likely to need something like shade cloth to reduce the temperatures. Oh, I'm going to do one more quickly. How do we measure the organic matter in the soil? That is do a soil test. Send it to a soil testing lab. CSU has one. Ward labs, weld labs, all can take your soil, test it, and tell you what your percent of organic matter is. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, Kathy. Yes. And I love the end of the webinar, all those rapid fire questions. I say either, you say neither, and I say neither. Either, either, and neither, neither. And let's call the whole thing off. Yes, you like potato, and I like potato. You like tomato, and I like tomato. Potato, potato, tomato, tomato. Let's call.